this hearing of the Select Committee on Energy Independence and Global Warming is called to order. Last February, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released the first report of their fourth assessment, which provided a scientific smoking gun that human activities were unequivocally responsible for global warming. Three more reports followed throughout 2007. Taken together, the fourth assessment reports represent the seminal review of the science of global warming, its impacts and strategies to address it. For their work in educating the world about both the dangers of global warming and the policies needed to prevent it, Dr. Rajendra Pachuri, chairman of the IPCC, and his colleagues were jointly awarded the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize with former Vice President Al Gore. With the award of the Peace Prize, the Nobel Committee acknowledged that stopping global warming is not just a matter of economics or environmental stewardship. It is a matter of war and peace. As the fourth assessment shows, the dangerous buildup of heat-trapping gases in the atmosphere due to human activities is already threatening the peace and security of communities around the world. Sea levels are rising. Rainfall patterns are changing. Public health is suffering. Conflicts are spawned and fed. And the disproportionate amount of injury is occurring in the developing world to the people least responsible for global warming. And so a scientific report highlights our moral obligation to reduce global warming pollution and prepare for those impacts that have become unavoidable. We can't mortgage the children of the planet's future by continuing to emit global warming pollution in the atmosphere unabated. We need to achieve real reductions now. The energy bill that becomes law in December, that has become law in December, was a significant down payment on the necessary emission reductions, but it was nowhere near sufficient to meet the enormous challenge which we face. In order to further reduce global warming pollution, the House will consider legislation this year that puts the United States on a path for an 80 percent reduction in our emissions by the year 2050. The obligations of the United States to adopt such policies is clear and compelling. When the Chinese and Indians look up in the sky, they see red, white, and blue CO2. The United States alone is responsible for over a quarter of the carbon dioxide increase in the atmosphere over the last 150 years. While China's total annual emissions may now equal those of the United States, U.S. emissions are still four times greater than China's on a per capita basis. It is time for the Congress to reestablish America's position in the fight against global warming as a leader and not a laggard. In his acceptance speech, Dr. Pachori quoted fellow Nobel Peace Prize winner Willie Brandt's observation that next to reasonable politics, Learning is the true, credible alternative to force. I believe history will look back upon the work of the IPCC, and especially the fourth assessment, as the very credible force that helped the world avoid catastrophic global warming conflicts and secure an equitable energy peace. So we're very proud of our witness today, and I think it is going to be an historic hearing. So let me turn and uh, now recognize the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee, for an opening statement. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is a, a tremendous honor for us in the House today to have Dr. Bachori here, because I really believe that you couldn't have any of the several billion folks on the planet uh, to be in a more pos important position than Dr. Bachori, and it's a great honor that he's joined us today. There really is no one else walking on the face of the earth that have played a bigger role uh, in preventing the Arctic eventually from disappearing, from preventing the desertification of substantial parts of the middle latitudes, 
from preventing us from losing a good portion of our Midwest agricultural base, from preventing millions from losing drinking water from the glaciers in the Himalayas, and from for preventing uh, the conflicts that my friend Ed Markey has talked about. And so it's really a great honor that you've joined us because uh, in spreading this news is allowing us to move. And Dr. Bachari and I had a chance to talk briefly before this hearing. And I just want to share one thing uh, with the good doctor who I know may have had some frustration with the rest of the world of the United States inability to move on global warming. And uh, given the certainty in the science, that has been frustrating. But the Calvary is on the way. Things are changing here. The ice is melting in the Arctic, but the ice of resistance to science is melting here in the United States Congress as well. And we are going to get this job done. I will be particularly attentive to Dr. Pachori's discussion of what our targets need to be to prevent these devastating losses. Looking at the report, it suggests that to have a 50 percent chance of stabilizing um, uh, temperature increases below 2.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels uh, would require that global emissions, global emissions peak by the year 2015 and reduce and industrialized uh, countries, including the United States, would have to decrease to 25 to 40 percent below 1990 levels by 2020. That is an incredibly important target. I will look forward to his discussion of why that is important, because the United States Congress will be setting targets, we hope, this year. We need to be more aggressive on those targets. To date, Doctor, I uh, regret to say no legislation has been introduced to achieve those targets. That is going to change shortly, and I hope that you will address the importance of those near-term targets to really tame this beast. Thank you very much. Great. Gentlemen's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the uh, gentlelady from South Dakota is her Seth Sandlin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for hosting this hearing. And I want to echo the sentiments of my colleague, Mr. Inslee, Doctor, for you being here and uh, the work uh, that you have done to address the serious issue of global climate change. I represent the state of South Dakota and the Great Plains, and so I'm very interested today in, in hearing more from your testimony and perhaps posing some questions as it relates to the risk of climate change uh, globally in agricultural sectors, but also the opportunities uh, that that provides for rural uh, parts of the world, uh, particularly the economic advantages of renewable energies in all forms, as well as the issue that we are going to be grappling with that actually got some attention here just a couple of days as it relates to the offsets that were purchased by the House of Representatives uh, and one of the projects being in the agricultural sector, actually perhaps two of them, and how we go about measuring and, and having standardized measurements um, for the carbon uh, that can be stored uh, in the soil based on farming types, grazing uh, practices, farming practices, uh, and the importance of making sure we get that right, uh, because there are already farmers and ranchers that are trading on the Chicago Climate Exchange, and I have uh, significant worries uh, about how that is currently structured, uh, what the value of those offsets will be in the future, and the monitoring uh, that is required. So thank you very much for being here today. look forward to your testimony. <coughs> Great. Gentlelady's time has expired. Over 2,000 of the world's top scientists from more than 130 countries contributed to the IPCC's fourth assessment. It takes an exceptionally talented individual to lead such a diverse group and produce such an outstanding analysis. I am honored to have such a pers person before the Select Committee this morning, Dr. Rajendra Pachori, Chairman of the IPCC. On December 10, 2007, the immense contribution of the IPCC was honored with the Nobel Peace Prize which Dr. Pachori accepted on behalf of the IPCC. I will enter his Nobel acceptance speech into the congressional record. In addition, his contributions to improving the global environment have been recognized by the Indian and the French governments. He was also named the science journal Nature's first ever newsmaker of the year. Dr. Pachori is also the Director General for the Energy and Resources Institute, Terry, in India where he has served as the chief executive since 1981. Understandably, the Indian government has asked him to serve in a variety of advisory roles, including his current membership in Prime Minister Singh's Council on Climate Change. He has a Ph.D. 
in industrial engineering and a Ph.D. in economics, both from the North Carolina State University in Raleigh. He has taught on, at a variety of academic institutions in, in the United States and India and served on a number of non-governmental organizations and business boards throughout the world. I am told he is, also a passion, he is also passionate about cricket and is a handy swing bowler, having taken 348 wickets for the Terry team. But I think it is more likely that Dr. Pachuri will get members of Congress to understand these climate change, client science uh, policies than cricket. Uh, it is not often that members get to learn from a Nobel laureate. And so I would ask unanimous consent that he is allowed to speak uh, 10 minutes in his opening remarks before we turn to questions from the subcommittee members. Uh, Dr. Pachuri, it's our honor to have you before us today. Whenever you are comfortable, please begin. Mr. Chairman, uh, honorable members, may I express my sense of privilege at being given this opportunity. Indeed, I have regarded the U.S. as a home because I have lived and worked over here, and therefore I have a special respect and a great deal of reverence for this remarkable institution which I think the whole world looks up to. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. And Mr. Chairman, you've already laid out, and so have the honorable members who have spoken, some of the major challenges and some of the major opportunities that we have globally. And you've also brought out the importance of timing and, and timeliness in taking action, because we really don't have a moment to lose. I would seek your privilege in um, presenting a very brief PowerPoint presentation. Uh, which essentially summarizes the testimony that I have submitted for this occasion. So I'll turn to the first slide, if I may. Ah, okay, it's there. Uh, next. Well, one important fact that we brought out in the fourth assessment report is that if we continue <coughs> with uh, GHG emissions, greenhouse gas emissions at current or uh, current levels or above that, then further warming would induce many changes in the global climate system during the 21st century that would very likely be larger than those observed during the 20th century. When we use the term very likely, it advisedly represents a probability over 90 percent. And therefore, we know based on projections that we have made that if we don't do anything to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases and stabilize the Earth's atmosphere, we would have warming and consequent other impacts that would be far more severe than what we have witnessed in the past. Next. What's of particular importance, given the fact that the U.S. is a major leader, uh, is the leadership, is the leader of the free world, and uh, clearly its actions and its positions have a major impact on peace and stability over the world, as the chairman has mentioned. The Norwegian Nobel Committee, by awarding the Nobel Peace Prize for 2007, has acknowledged the importance of stabilizing the Earth's climate, in the absence of which we would clearly run into problems of disruption of peace and stability in different parts of the world. Now, if we look at the impacts on the poor regions, next, then we know, based on our projections, that <clears throat> people would be exposed to increased water stress by 2020 to the extent of 120 to 1.2 billion in Asia, 75 to 250 millions in Africa, 12 to 81 million in Latin America. And therefore, we must keep this in mind, particularly since several parts of the world already suffer from water stress. And climate change would only add to these stresses and exacerbate them to a point where they could be uh, critical in determining the stability, the well-being of these societies. Uh, we also know that there would be a decline in agriculture in several parts of the world, um, roughly 50 percent by 2020 in some African countries, 30 percent by 2050 in Central and South Asia, and 30 percent by 2080 in Latin America. And I might mention, uh, Mr. Chairman, that uh, there is evidence from my own country, India, where agricultural scientists are now finding that several crops 
are actually experiencing declines in yields, wheat in particular. And wheat is very, very sensitive to temperature increases at a particular point of its growth cycle. <coughs> if those uh, temperature increases are anywhere between 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius, they have a major impact uh, on the decline of uh, productivity of the wheat crop. And we have growing evidence of that in India. I'm mentioning this because uh, this clearly has major implications for food security worldwide. Next. We also see the possibility of abrupt or irreversible impacts. Next. <clears throat> for instance, uh, partial loss of uh, the ice sheets on polar land, which includes essentially Greenland and uh, the West Antarctic ice sheet, could imply several meters of sea level rise. And uh, I know that you have visited Greenland, uh, Mr. Chairman, and you've seen visibly the kinds of changes that are taking place over there. This clearly would be a disaster if it was to occur. Uh, next, We also know that 20 to 30 percent of the species that the IPCC has assessed are likely to be at risk of extinction if increases in warming exceed 1.5 to 2.5 degrees Celsius. And these are abrupt and irreversible changes because once this kind of damage takes place, we really have no way of turning back. Next. We also know, next, the impacts on North America would be quite uh, considerable. Uh, warming in the western mountains is projected to cause decreased snowpack and reduce summer flows. And this will exacerbate competition for over-allocated water resources in these regions. Uh, next, major challenges are projected for crops that are near the warm end of their suitable range or which depend on highly utilized water resources. Uh, so there would be unfavorable impacts on agriculture as a result. Uh, we also know that increased number, intensity, and duration of heat waves will have potential for adverse health impacts. I don't want to draw attention uh, to uh, what happened in Europe, for instance, in the year 2003, but I think it does provide an important example <coughs> of the kind of infrastructure that would be required to deal with heat waves. And you would recall that in 2003, in the city of Paris and its uh, surrounding areas, there were about 30,000 lives that were lost as a result of heat wave. And I might mention this kind of thing happens periodically and uh, regularly in different parts of the developing world because you just don't have the health care and early warning infrastructure whereby people's lives could be saved. Uh, we also know that coastal communities and habitats will be increasingly stressed by climate change impacts interacting with development and pollution. So uh, there are going to be a diverse set of impacts of climate change on North America, which makes it necessary for North America to be a part of the solution for global as well as local reasons. Next. Now I'd like to highlight the fact that uh, there is a certain inertia in the climate system. If we were to uh, freeze the concentration of greenhouse gases, even at current levels, further warming would continue for the next two decades at a rate of about 0.1 degrees Celsius per decade. So there is a certain inertia in the system as a result of which, even with very stringent immediate measures, we would see climate change continuing for some period of time. And we know that the energy system inertia is also uh, particularly relevant because if you look at buildings, if you look at other infrastructure which uses energy, you really can't bring about immediate changes simply because there's a lot of locked-in capital and technology which can't be changed overnight. So we need to be concerned about the fact that even if we were to take very ambitious steps today, we would find it very difficult to stop climate change for several decades, all of which means that we have to bring about mitigation measures as early as possible because otherwise, the impacts of climate change will become more serious over a period of time. And therefore, choices about the scale and timing of mitigation measures would involve balancing costs of emission reductions against the risks of delay. And the risks of delay essentially translate 
into impacts of climate change, which could become very serious and severe. Next. <clears throat> now, this is an important table which I'd like to draw uh, your kind attention to. And I want to focus on the first row of numbers that are shown over here. The IPCC has uh, uh, examined several stabilization scenarios. And this, the one that's shown at the top indicates stabilization at roughly current levels of, of uh, concentration that we have today in CO2 equivalent terms. Now, this would limit temperature increase to 2 to 2.4 degrees Celsius. And as the chairman <laughs> pointed out earlier, uh, <clears throat> if we were to achieve this particular scenario, it's essential that we ensure that uh, the emissions of greenhouse gases don't increase beyond the year 2015, and therefore they must decline beyond that date. This gives us a very short window of opportunity. And I might say that the IPCC, of course, does not recommend any particular level of stabilization because we are an assessment body, but we look at various scenarios and we present the facts related to each of these. And then it's really up to the negotiators and decision makers on the basis of value judgments to decide what it is that would be the right level of, uh, for stabilization. Now, here I might say this is not really such a favorable scenario because if you look at global sea level rise as a result of even this fairly ambitious scenario, we would have sea level rise due to thermal expansion alone. And this does not take into account, I repeat, the uh, melting of uh, the ice bodies across the globe. This would give you thermal expansion leading to sea level rise of 0 0.4 to 1.4 meters. Now, if you talk to somebody in the Maldive Islands or in some of the South Pacific Islands, they will tell you that this level of sea level increase is going to be disastrous for them. And therefore, I think what we require is a value judgment in deciding where the world wants to stabilize uh, its concentration of greenhouse gases. Is this good enough or should we really do better progressively over a period of time? Next. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I'd like to highlight some of the core benefits of mitigation. And since I have the privilege of addressing the energy independence and global warming uh, uh, select committee, uh, reducing emissions of greenhouse gases will lead to health co-benefits from, re from reduced air pollution. There would certainly be increased energy security. There would be greater rural employment. And as the honorable member has just reminded us about the opportunities in the agricultural sector, uh, if we were to use renewable energy technologies on a decentralized basis, there would be a generation of jobs and employment opportunities in several rural areas. And may I emphasize this is of particular relevance to the developing countries where you still have a very large percentage of the population living in rural areas. And there would be benefits of increased agricultural production and reduced pressure on natural ecosystems because uh, there would be decreased tropospher tropospheric ozone concentrations. There would also be co-benefits of mitigation action which would offset mitigation costs and provide the opportunity of no regrets policy. So in other words, the costs of mitigation should be reduced to the extent that you have these core benefits as a result. Next. Now I'd like to uh, emphasize the fact that the cost of mitigation, even at a very stringent and ambitious level, will not be high at all. If you look at the last row in this particular table, you would find that stabilization at a level equivalent to what I had pointed to earlier, 445 uh, parts per million of CO2 equivalent and thereabouts, uh, would result in a reduction of GDP of less than 3% in the year 2030. And this amounts to a reduction of 0.12% annually. Now, what does this mean in uh, very simple terms, I'll turn to the next slide. <clears throat> this really, next. This means that if there was GDP without mitigation, this is the kind of line you would get, next. 
and with mitigation, next, you would get a slight shift of this line, which really means that the level of prosperity that the world would reach in 2030 would at best be postponed by a few months or at the most a year or so. That's clearly not a very high price to pay. And particularly if you were to account for the co-benefits from mitigation actions, this cost could be even lower. Next. <clears throat> now, I'd like to highlight the fact that, next, all stabilizations that we have assessed can be achieved by deployment of a portfolio of technologies that are currently available or expected to be commercialized in coming decades. So we really don't have to wait for anything dramatic, anything miraculous. We have all the technologies that are required to uh, carry out the mitigation uh, measures that we have assessed. Next. Uh, but of course, this assumes that investment flows, technology transfer, and incentives are in place for technology development. And this only highlights the fact that technology by itself is not going to do enough. You really need policies and a framework of policies that would lead to development of the right technologies and would also lead to uh, <coughs> their dissemination on a large scale. And I come more or less to the end of my presentation. Next, <coughs> why should we adhere to deep cuts in greenhouse gas emissions? Well, firstly, the world is going to move towards the low-carbon future. And if that's the case, U.S. companies must look at the opportunities that they have in business if they're going to focus on the future. And those companies that don't are obviously going to lose in terms of profits as well as reputation. And may I submit that nations would also fall within a certain similar categorization. Those nations that are seen to take action will certainly command a lot more political and moral power than those that do not. And therefore, I think it's essential, may I submit, for the U.S. to take action. And I go to the next slide. The role of the U.S. is critical because it would enable the achievement of global stabilization targets, would ensure U.S. competitiveness in a world market dominated by low carbon products, and undoubtedly reestablish confidence in U.S. leadership on critical global issues. Uh, finally, may I submit before you uh, an important philosophical perspective. <coughs> I think overall we must remember that we as human beings are a part of nature. Nature is not subordinate to us, and I think it is to the benefit of human society to be able to find a pattern of development that ensures the sustainability and the conservation of natural resources. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Pachuri, very much. Um, and I'll turn and recognize the um, gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee, for 10 minutes. Doctor, thank you for closing with a quote from Chief Seattle uh, about us being part of the, the weft of life. We appreciate that. I can tell you the Chief's spirit is still alive in Seattle, and that's where we're fighting to keep our snow and our salmon and our orcas, all of which are endangered by this, uh, this problem. So I really appreciate you honoring us with Chief Seattle. I hope you spread it around the globe. I think it works everywhere around the, around the planet. I want to focus on what should be our relatively short-term targets. And I have to tell you that uh, uh, I have been very active on this front now uh, with many of the members of this panel, but I have been stunned by your science that your team has developed uh, on the level of, of how fast we have to move. I, you know, several years ago I was thinking, well, we have to get ready for 2050. Your science has been a real, uh, uh, dash of cold water telling us, no, we've got to get ready by 2015 and 2020. And I want to ask you for your advice in that regard. Uh, first off, I want to talk about the level that might get us into problems. And I was looking at your report, and it suggested that uh, at a 2.5 Celsius level, if we, if we are successful in holding the increase it to 2.5 degrees Celsius, that still will result in a significant risk of extinction of 20 to 30 percent of all the species on the planet. So somewhere approaching a fifth to a third of all the species in the planet could be gone forever if we hold it at 2.5 degrees Celsius. Now to me that ought to be an absolute minimalist goal because we're still going to have significant loss to the planet at that level. I then go down to the next several pages of your report, 
And you are telling us that to hold the world at that level, we have got to peak CO2 emissions by 2015, and the industrialized world, including America, has to go down by 25 to 40 percent below 1990 levels by 2020. 20 to 40 percent reductions below our 1990 levels by 2020. Now, the reason I want you to address this target is that that level, which to me is absolutely minimal, we ought to be more aggressive than that as our target because losing more than a third of our species to me is incomprehensible. And yet, I must tell you that no bill to date has been introduced in the U.S. Congress to come anywhere close to those target levels, including ones that I have introduced. And that's going to change. We are going to be introducing legislation to get to closer to those targets. But I think your visit here today could be a real eye-opener to my colleagues about why that short-term, and we're all talking about 2050, why that short-term target is so important and why it has to be more aggressive than, frankly, anything we're talking about. We've had a bill to have a level of 1990 levels by 2020 that's moved through the Senate committee. And frankly, from your scientific testimony, that appears wholly inadequate to the task at hand. So I guess if you could just uh, elaborate on those levels and the 2020 targets we should be thinking of as industrialized countries. Thank you for that comment and question, sir. May, may I submit that the issue of deciding where the world should stabilize the increase of temperatures and therefore of concentration levels really involves a value judgment. And I think an issue that is often ignored is the whole equity dimension of this problem. If one talks to somebody, let's say, in the Maldive Islands, and the president of the Maldives, in fact, is coming over to a major event next week to New Delhi that I'm organizing, he will tell you that they're already in peril. <clears throat> because most of the islands in that nation are at a height of a meter or a maximum of, of two meters above sea level. And they don't even have to wait to be inundated. I remember that in 1997, uh, the IPCC held its uh, plenary session in the Maldive Islands, and President Gayoum stood before us, and he says, ladies and gentlemen, 10 years ago, the place where you're holding this meeting was under about two feet of water because they have storm surges, they have natural events, which with the high level of the sea only inundates large areas of land. So the point I'd like to make, uh, sir, is the fact that when we're thinking of a global target, we really need to look at some of the equity implications of setting that target. If you look at the country of Bangladesh, they have a large coastline, highly vulnerable to all kinds of natural disasters, which become so much worse with sea level rise. But what are we going to protect them? It's a densely populated country. Uh, highly dependent on agriculture. And every time they have a massive coastal flood, they find it very difficult to save lives and property. Now, you really can't create infrastructure for them like the dikes in the Netherlands. Perhaps that might be feasible, but the kinds of resources that would be required would be very, very high. If you look at the Himalayan range, where the glaciers are melting very rapidly, and the entire river systems going into the northern part of the subcontinent and parts of China originate in these glaciers. And with the reduced flow that we project, <clears throat> there would be about 500 million people in South Asia that would face fairly serious reduction of water availability, and about 250 million in, in China. The reason why I'm mentioning these facts, sir, is because when we set a target at the global level, and, and I hope the US would be a leader in establishing these targets, we need to look at what's going to happen around the world. And I would agree with you as a human being, not necessarily as chairman of the IPCC, that we need to question this figure of 2.5 degrees Celsius increase in temperature. Is that good enough, or should we be looking at something less? And I think that's an issue that negotiators and political leaders need to decide. And as you rightly mentioned, species loss of 20 to 30% is clearly a huge loss 
that we have to do everything to prevent. It could make such a difference to ecosystems across the planet. It could make an enormous difference to economic activities that human beings are responsible for. That we really need to look at this issue and it involves a value judgment. It involves looking at what's going to happen to the rest of the world. And I think it's for a leadership, uh, a leader in the, in the global committee of nations like the US to start articulating some of the measures that are required. So I would say that the IPCC's assessment of industrialized countries reducing emissions by 25 to 40 percent by 2020 <clears throat> is based on this particular stabilization level. But maybe this is something that needs to be revisited five or ten years in the future. Uh, for the time being, perhaps if we want to stabilize at that level of 2 to 2.4 degrees Celsius, then clearly this is something that's inevitable and peaking by 2015 is an essential part of such a, such a strategy. May I just say in conclusion, I suppose it's for this reason that the Conference of the Parties in Bali spent so much time and attention talking about this 25 to 40 percent reduction figure. Of course, this was not accepted in the final statement, but I'm happy to see that at least the wording in the final statement called for deep cuts in emissions. And I hope nobody waters down those deep cuts because we do need deep cuts in emissions. So I take it your scientific assessment is if all industrialized nations followed the most aggressive bill that's in the U.S. Congress right now, it's the bill that's gone through the Senate, it would simply call for the United States, and for the purposes of this question, we'll assume all industrialized nations met this level, and it simply called for reaching 1990 levels by 2020, not the 25 to 40 percent reduction you've suggested. If, in fact, that's the goal, and if, in fact, that goal was met, it would still result in a more than 50-50 proposition of losing 20 to 30 percent of our species, substantial loss of shorelines, substantial loss of agricultural productivity, and substantial loss of water. Is that in other words, we would still have these? We still would have these. We would still have more heat waves. We would still have extreme precipitation events. And we would still have this commitment to sea level rise which due to thermal expansion alone would be quite significant. And is it, this is a non-scientific <coughs> statement, but as a human stepping out of your hat as IPC chairman for the moment, would you agree that every culture and community in the world would believe that is unacceptable and therefore believe that we ought to have a more aggressive target than that 1990 level for industrialized nations? As a human being, sir, this prospect causes me deep anguish because I would really question whether human progress that's going to result in these kinds of outcomes can really be labeled as human progress. I appreciate that. I don't want to leave on that note of gloom. I want to suggest we're fully capable of solving this problem. I gave you a book I've written about this. We're, we're advancing this issue in Congress. We're going to join you in this effort. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Okay, the gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes for 10 minutes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I won't take the 10 minutes, and I'm probably not going to be able to, to stay and, and, uh, and listen to uh, a gentleman that I have a great deal of an ad admiration and respect for. In fact, I'd like to uh, apologize to you uh, and uh, the other scientists have done, have done so much work uh, to bring us to this point, and uh, I, I, um, my level of embarrassment uh, was rising with the sea level uh, when Harlan Wilson, uh, who represented the United States uh, in Bali, uh, said that uh, we are not ready to commit, and those four words are probably the words that have been used in, any, in every generation to slow progress. Uh, we are not ready to commit. Uh, so I'm, I appreciate all of the uh, work that you've done uh, I have, uh, I've got to go and catch a bus outside. The, the, uh, uh, the, the question that I would love to have time to listen to, to you respond to is if, if, if all of the CO2 emissions were stopped today at a quarter to 10, uh, what would happen? Uh, uh, and what could be reversed? Um, I'm going to, to submit a statement, Mr. Chairman, and, uh, and, and hope that 
if you have time to, to respond to that question, that I can uh, get your answer through uh, uh, the committee. Thank you very kindly. I know the gentleman has to leave, but um, I don't. I think with uh, the uh, acquiescence of the other members of the committees, we would like to have you answer that question right now, and uh, if you could, and uh, we and we understand that the gentleman from Missouri has uh, urgent business that he has to attend to, but we thank him for coming. So, but please I, respond to the question, sir. I, I I'd like to respond to the honourable member. There, I'd be very happy to send you a detailed response to this question, sir. But in um, in, in, in summary form, let me say that if we were to stop all emissions today, climate change would still continue for several decades. And that's precisely why we cannot allow this state of affairs to continue, because if we don't do anything, then clearly the impacts would become far more severe and far more difficult to handle. But this also highlights the importance of adaptation measures. Because if climate change is to continue as we know it will, uh, irrespective of what we do today, we need stringent mitigation measures to minimize, postpone, delay, or avoid future impacts. Uh, but at the same time, we would also need to take in hand several adaptation measures to be able to handle the impacts of climate change that are going to take place in the future. But I'd be very happy to send you a detailed response. Uh, in yes, I would appreciate it. Thank you so kindly. With great privilege. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the general lady from South Dakota. Ms. Hurst has, oh, uh, uh, chair, no, let me, let, me, uh, uh, let, let me continue. The chair recognizes the general lady from South Dakota. Ms. Hurst has Sandler for 10 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, doctor, thank you for your testimony. And if we could spend a, a few minutes on agriculture. Um, if you could respond to uh, this proposition. I have a constituent uh, in the western part of South Dakota who believes quite strongly that the agricultural sector, not just in the United States, but across the world, but in the United States in particular, is essential in transitioning uh, from where we are now to deploying new technologies, particularly in the coal-fired plant facilities for electricity generation, because he feels that there is potential within the agricultural sector to work as a carbon sink so that the greenhouse gas emissions don't get any worse from now until we get these new technologies online. Would you respond to that proposition? Do you agree? Uh, disagree, and if you agree, um, how imperative is it uh, that agriculture be participating in a cap-and-trade system if indeed that's the direction that we choose to go in the United States, but also perhaps integrating agriculture into the European cap-and-trade system? Uh, <clears throat> Conceptually, ma'am, I think, yes, agriculture should be a part of any such scheme that involves mitigation of uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions. And I would combine with this forestry options as well, because anything that grows by way of biomass has the potential to uh, fix carbon dioxide. And I think it should be part of an accounting system. But having said so, there are problems in terms of measurement, verification, and monitoring, all of which need to be sorted out. I think it's also essential for us to look at the net emissions from uh, agriculture. And in several parts of the world, these are quite serious. They do result in greenhouse gas emissions. So we may need to modify agricultural practices. In some cases, we might even have to design new crops. And you know, this may be essential simply because there's likely to be a decline in the yields and productivity of some crops. And therefore, I think there's a huge research and development agenda, which I think countries like the U.S. can really take a leadership role in and provide answers for the rest of the world. I mean, this is a country that really brought about the green revolution in the rest of the world. What we need now is a new kind of revolution, which hopefully will also help to reduce uh, the net emissions of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So this could become a major objective in terms of research and development. Well, thank you so much for your response, because you touched on a couple of other issues I'd like to 
uh, explore. And given the realities that you've illuminated through the scientific analysis that Mr. Inslee was exploring with you as well, the recognition that uh, given um, the projections and the pressure and the demand by many for industries to adapt, I also think it's very important that non-governmental organizations, that environmental organizations in particular, also take a step back and reassess the positions that they have advocated in the past in light of uh, the imperative of acting to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So when we passed the energy bill last December, unfortunately at the last minute, a change was made to the definition of biomass as it related to the participation in the renewable fuel standard to prohibit the use of biomass off federal lands for qualifying toward meeting the targets in the renewable fuel standard. Biomass in a national forest that if it's left to rot emits methane into the atmosphere, biomass that if burned emits carbon into the atmosphere, and I understand that we have to make sure that we're not turning our national forests into fuel farms. No one wants that. But within the existing forest planning process, I think we can address these issues. And so when you mentioned forestry practices, I think that not only in the discussion of deforestation and the problems associated with that and finding the right balance uh, between the need for increased yields and crop production so that we have food security and also its role in energy security, uh, I do th appreciate your reference uh, to biomass, and I would just uh, uh, I'll bring to my colleagues' attention on the committee that I am introducing a bill uh, to fix the definition, I think it needs a fix in biomass, to allow the use of biomass off federal lands in the United States to participate in the renewable fuel standard. It was an egregious change at the last minute. We had a consensus on that definition, and I would like your ideas on whether or not you think, uh, from your experience, biomass, whether it's off federal lands in the U.S., or maybe you could elaborate when you referenced biomass being an important part uh, of evaluating the forestry options as it relates to agriculture, and then also the design of new crops. We have a lot of organizations across the world that are opposed to genetically modified organisms. Now, as it relates to food scares in other parts of the world, I've been eating GMOs for over 10 years. You know, I, a lot of us have uh, here in the United States. But when we're talking about biofuels production, and we're talking about drought-resistant crops to be grown in different parts of the developing world as well, I think that that's another area where people have to take a step back and say, what is the reality of today? And do we need to reassess as it relates to the priorities of what we're dealing with environmentally, as well as the energy security issues and food security issues? So if you could maybe elaborate just a little bit more on, on the reference to biomass and forestry practices, and the issue of genetically modified organisms as it relates to the crop varieties, that even if there continues, continues to be resistant, resistance on the food front, that we have to address the issue of crop varieties, whether they're GMOs, drought resistant, what have you, to address the issue of um, water resources and increasing crop yields in light of the climate change uh, challenges we face. I would agree with you uh, on this approach, ma'am, because uh, I really think we need to look at new scenarios of how biomass can be part of the solution, not only in terms of reducing emissions of greenhouse gases, but providing food as well as, as, well as fuel. Now, uh, it's obvious that if we can come up with a technology that converts cellulosic material into liquid fuels, for instance, it just opens up a huge opportunity. There are parts of the world where you've got large quantities of agricultural residue, which is really a nuisance and it's just burnt on the fields. Now, if you had a technology by which uh, this residue could be converted to useful energy, then I think it just opens up an enormous opportunity. And this is where I would submit that research and development in this country can make an enormous difference. It creates opportunities for the world as a whole. And I think if we can develop such a technology, there are large areas of wasteland in different parts of the world 
where you could grow inferior crops, inferior forms of biomass, which may not have any other purpose, but can be converted as cellulosic material into useful fuels. So I think this is where imagination has to be exercised. On the issue of GMOs, I mean, I fully appreciate that we have to build in safeguards. We've got to carry out trials. We've got to make sure that there are no ill effects from any kind of genetically modified crop. But you don't make the best the enemy of the good. You just don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I think, therefore, it's absolutely essential for us to look at the potential of GMO. I mean, this is science which can work to the benefit of the human race. So why should we not work with opportunities by which, who knows, in the future perhaps you don't need dwarf varieties of crops. You might need those that have large quantities of biomass and much taller varieties so that quite apart from giving you food, these would also give you large quantities of fuel. So I, I really think that in the agricultural sector, we need to look at a whole range of scenarios and exercise our imagination by which we can then lay down research and development priorities and come up with some of these solutions. I think the agricultural sector can really make an enormous difference in this entire field. There's a huge area of land in different parts of the world that could be used fruitfully for producing uh, some of these uh, products and energy. Thank you very much for your testimony. And, and uh, you may know this already, but I, I think I've mentioned it to the chairman as well and for Mr. Hall. There is the technology uh, exists currently in Upton, Wyoming, right across the border from South Dakota, where they've been using slash piles off the National Forest in the Black Hills and off private lands as well to convert woody biomass into cellulosic ethanol. And they are looking to expand not only at that plant, but elsewhere uh, throughout the region. And um, I'm sure you can imagine their response when the biomass definition in the energy bill would not allow them to qualify uh, toward the RFS when they couldn't use the um, uh, slash piles off the National Forest. And here they are ready to move us forward within the next you know, year or two toward commercial development of cellulosic ethanol. And yet uh, they now face uh, uh, some barriers to their potential growth and, and sharing that tech, obviously moving that technology uh, to benefit the economic uh, uh, situation here and, and the marketplace overall. So thank you very much for your testimony and your insights. The general ladies, time has expired. The chair recognizes the uh, gentleman from New York State, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I apologize for being late. And I apologize to the witness as well. Uh, uh, Congresswoman, I'd be happy to uh, support your your bill. Uh, we have in my district and in the Hudson Valley uh, several cellulosic ethanol uh, producers who are currently uh, operating, one of them being a wood uh, sustainable tree farm, which is making high-end furniture for sale in New York business rooms, big large conference tables that are varnished within an inch of its life so you can see your reflection uh, off the off the wood and they take all the sawdust and all the leaves and twigs and the little wood cuttings from the ends of the boards and grind them and put them into the uh, enzyme vat and the uh, the biodiesel generator and they run all their farm vehicles and all of their road vehicles off of their own uh, biodiesel and plant as many trees as they cut uh, they're not in a position because it's not they didn't attempt to do this, but they're not in a position to sell at this point, but they're certainly self-sufficient and it's a break-even, better than a break-even process. Uh, and then there's another, at least one more commercial biodiesel, uh, actually a very interesting project in my district, which involves converting municipal solid waste after uh, humans and machines remove such things as batteries and, and uh, pesticides and uh, uh, other household hazardous waste that you don't want to uh, get into the environment, and recyclables, and then they wind up with paper waste, wood waste, uh, plant waste, farm waste, et cetera, et cetera. It all goes into a gasification process, which then spins a turbine and gen generates uh, uh, megawatts, tens of megawatts of power and ethanol at the same time, and 48% uh, of the gas that they generate is hydrogen so that they can actually charge hydrogen fuel cells if we ever get to the point where we have have cars to do that with um, 
from the gas that they're currently producing. So there's, it's not even so much a matter of research and development, from, although that's certainly needed, but there are technologies where it's just a matter of investing them I and get just building them, you know, and, and uh, in terms of the, the biomass the, uh, uh, that's removed from the national parks or pr from private land, I think that the equation has to do with how much fossil fuel of what kind has to be burned to provide the energy to get that out to the facility where it's converted to cellulosic ethanol and making sure that that's a net gainer. And the solution to that is to have those vehicles and those machines be driven by renewables uh, to begin with. But anyway, to my questions. Uh, we just had, uh, in the last three years in my district in New York, uh, three 50-year floods, uh, floods that are only expected in that intensity uh, once every 50 years. Uh, is that consistent with the computer models that you've been looking at? So if I might respond, around the world, essentially some of these floods are going to become more frequent and certainly more severe. So I think when we talk about adaptation measures, then clearly we would have to take into account the responses that society should build in to something that, let's say, happened once in 50 years, now occurring ev every once in five years or so. Right. I mean, part of my job as a representative, I think, is to be a two-way conduit of information uh, from my constituents as I represent them here uh, in the United States Congress, but also to try to bring back information such as you are providing for us today and to educate them uh, in, and pass on the information to them. Uh, and, uh, you know, with that in mind, I would I also ask, I know that there can be anomalies and that the overall trend has ups and downs and a cycle, a natural cycle of warmer and colder, but that the overall trend is warmer. Uh, the fact that we've had two winters now in the Northeast where uh, in Northeast Dutchess County, which usually is uh, pretty cold up on the ridge that I live on and snowy, uh, we've had the last two years daytime highs between 50 and 60 degrees Fahrenheit right through uh, the winter holidays, uh, the Hanukkah, Christmas, New Year's uh, holidays and into January, uh, and then uh, relatively light snow events followed by quick thaws, uh, and at this point have uh, a snowpack that's to be measured in the, you know, if a few inches as opposed to what used to be uh, feet. Uh, would that be consistent with the models that you're seeing? Yes, in fact, here again, may I say globally, sir, um, 11 of the 12 warmest years in history since we've had instrumental record of temperatures <coughs> have occurred in the last 12 years. And I can tell you from my own experience, I was born in the mountains in India. And I remember looking at the snow-capped peaks, the highest peaks in the world. I went to one of these places where I could get a beautiful view of these mountain peaks during Christmas this last year in December. And I couldn't believe the, the thin covering of ice that I saw on these peaks. It's happening the world over. I've been to the Arctic region. and. Uh, you just have to see to believe what's happening over there. I was, uh, thank you, Doctor. I was in uh, Los Angeles on Sunday and um, uh, just out there for a day, but the lady who picked me up at the airport in a driving rainstorm, I think that was the third day in a row they'd had of, of record rainfall, mudslides and so on, and she told me that there had been a tornado uh, that touched down, uh, I think it was in Hollywood or somewhere close to there on Sunday, and it was the first one that anybody could remember uh, in the Los Angeles area, uh, I'm sure that must have happened sometime, but um, that sort of extreme weather event would also be consistent. Uh, so whereas one, any one of them by themselves does not prove anything, uh, at some point one might look at uh, uh, these extreme weather events around the world, whether we have um, uh, been fortunate in the last few years to dodge another Hurricane Katrina, but the Yucatan Peninsula uh, got hit uh, in that area of Central America and Mexico was hit this past summer during hurricane season very hard and there was super cyclone in Bangladesh and other places and uh, um, so I'm just trying to make sure that um, that we as Americans and that my constituents understand uh, the connection between them and the changes that we see in the Arctic and the Greenland ice sheet and uh, um, other 
projected changes that you describe in your testimony. Um, as you know, uh, this year we passed, or last year in December, the Congress passed energy legislation with a historic increase in, uh, for us, for our country, in vehicle fuel economy and energy efficient measures, efficiency measures. Uh, can you briefly discuss what impact these actions have had, if any, on the views in the IPCC or internationally about U.S. efforts? Uh, what else can Congress do to send the message to the rest of the world that we're serious about fighting uh, with other countries against climate change? Um, if you, you would grant me the privilege, so let me just respond to what you said about these extreme events. We have found <clears throat> that, for instance, extreme precipitation events, that means heavy quantities of precipitation in short periods of time, are on the increase and will continue to increase. So what you described in Los Angeles, of course, could be an isolated event, but if one was to look at <clears throat> the trend, that's the kind of picture that one can foresee. Uh, on the issue of uh, the energy bill that, was, uh, that came into existence in December, I think this clearly sends a very favorable message around the world. Because if I could be candid, the perception around the world is that the U.S. has not been very active in this area. The U.S. did not ratify the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, Australia didn't do it, but now with the new government, one of the first things they did was to ratify the Kyoto Protocol. And I think this legislation has certainly made a difference. It has certainly created, I think, genuinely an impression that the U.S. is now serious about business. On the question that you asked, sir, on what else needs to be done, may I submit that I think the starting point would be to say that the U.S., like other developed countries, is going to stabilize <coughs> excuse me, the concentration of greenhouse gases at a particular level that could be decided on, and then work backwards to see how you might be able to implement measures to achieve those levels. Now, one of the things that we have brought out very clearly in the IPCC reports is, firstly, you need policy measures to bring about technological change. You certainly need a price on carbon, because if you want to use the market to bring about changes in the future, Unless you price carbon appropriately, I don't think you would get the research and development efforts, the technology development efforts, to give you the kinds of outcomes that you're looking for. So I think there are some measures that would have to be put in place to bring about a pricing of carbon at an appropriate level. Now, this may involve taxation, this may involve cap and trade systems, but I think that's absolutely critical. Thank you very much. Uh, my time just expired, but uh, I, if I may, I just wanted to ask uh, one more question, which is, um, since the Hudson River, which splits my district, uh, I, I have three counties to the east of the Hudson and two to the west, and the Hudson River is tidal all the way from New York City up to Troy, just north of Albany, New York, um, and I, I just like my constituents to have some idea of what they can expect uh, since the freight rail line on the west bank of the Hudson and the passenger rail line on the east bank of the Hudson are only a few feet above the current river level. Uh, and many communities have spent a lot of money and people have invested in time and energy and uh, are very excited about uh, rebuilding their waterfronts with restaurants and shops and promenades and, and so on. Uh, how high might we, in a sort of medium case and then a worst case a scenario, I assume you don't think that we are likely to achieve a best case scenario, but if we achieve a medium and then a worst case scenario, how high would you expect the a tidal estuary like the Hudson to rise in the next 50 years, say? To be quite honest, one would have to carry out very specific modeling of that region <clears throat> to see what's going to happen. But our projections for sea level rise by the end of this century lie between 18 to 59 centimeters. So let's say if average sea level rise, which doesn't mean this will be uniform across the globe, was to be anywhere close to the upper end of our projections, then you're talking about half a meter increase in sea levels. And with storm surges, with all kinds of natural events, Tides. that clearly poses a very serious problem. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
I thank the gentleman very much, and the uh, chair will now recognize himself for a round of questions, and, we, and I think we'll have an opportunity to come back to the members if they have other questions which they would like to ask. Um, you have already spoken, um, Dr. Pachuri, about um, the fact that the level of global warming pollution uh, could keep uh, the temperature rise to uh, upwards of 4 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, the IPCC has reviewed over 100 greenhouse gas stabilization scenarios, and recently John, John, uh, Jim Connaughton uh, in the White House on President Bush's staff described all of those scenarios as a range of responsible paths. Do you agree with that statement? Well, the IPCC has looked at a whole range of outcomes, and we, of course, are in no position to predict how the economy is going to grow, how technology is going to grow. What we have is a range of plausible scenarios, and we have a high level of confidence that these scenarios essentially represent the kinds of outcomes that we're likely to see in the future. And as part of that, we've examined these stabilization scenarios, one of which I directed your attention to, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> it's obvious to me that if we want to limit temperature increase to a level like, say, 2 to 2.4 degrees Celsius, then we necessarily have to stabilize the concentration of greenhouse gases at 445 parts per million of CO2 equivalent and above, slightly above, which is more or less where we are today. And that's precisely why we came up with this deadline, if I could use the term, of 2015, by which we would have to ensure that we start reducing emissions globally. So um, I would say that the scenarios that we've looked at are plausible. We stand by them. And if we have to limit temperature increase to anything that the world decides on, then those are the kinds of trajectories that we'll have to achieve. So what, under the scenarios which you looked at, uh, could you talk about some of them at higher temperatures, at higher uh, degrees of Fahrenheit increase, uh, another two degrees Fahrenheit, another four degrees Fahrenheit, in terms of the impact that it would have upon uh, the world as you examine those patterns? What was the conclusion the IPCC came to in terms of uh, how the world would be affected? Uh, for the first time, we have come up with a table which clearly shows temperature increase and a range of impacts that are going to occur in areas like water, ecosystems, food security, human health. And this particular table, which I'd be very happy to draw your attention to, Mr. Chairman, clearly indicates that anything that goes above 2 degrees Celsius is really going to cause some very serious problems. And, and 2 degrees Celsius translates into what Fahrenheit? About 4 degrees uh, Fahrenheit? Roughly, roughly 4, four degrees Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, if one was to link that temperature increase with um, the kinds of impacts that we're going to face, uh, again, one is looking at different regions of the world. Some of them, of course, will be much worse hit than other regions. I mean, I gave some numbers about Africa, for instance. Uh, we would find 75 to 250 million people in Africa suffering from water stress by 2020. Uh, and that's a pretty serious situation because there already is a very serious problem of water availability in several parts of Africa. Food security is another area. And may I mention that uh, climate change is going to add to existing stresses. Now, the entire agricultural subsidy problem really impacts him unfavorably on a number of poor countries where farmers really are not able to compete with subsidized food produced, let's say, in Europe or possibly in North America. Um, and on top of that, if they have decline in yields as a result of climate change, it really wipes them out. They really don't know how to survive. Now, could you talk to us a little bit about some of the other benefits that uh, the world would derive in the public health sector from the efforts to reduce CO2 in terms of how that would also have the 
uh, same uh, benefits or similar benefits in reduction of uh, sulfur uh, and the, redu the reduction of uh, other pollutants uh, that contribute to smog, that contribute to uh, other public health problems. How does that, all of that interrelate in terms of uh, the public health uh, impact on the planet? Yes, sir. I think there's a range of health benefits that would accrue from stabilizing the world's climate. Firstly, heat waves. We know as temperatures increase, as climate change progresses, heat waves will become more frequent, more intense, and these obviously are a great health hazard. They can affect morbidity and mortality of large populations, as we've seen, for instance, in the case of the heat wave that took place in Europe in 2003. We know that vector-borne diseases, including diseases like malaria, would be on the increase. Uh, just to give you an example, Recently, there be, there's been an increase in diseases in countries like Italy, where temperatures have been going up. And a lot of uh, the pests, a lot of the vector-borne diseases uh, would become more prevalent with higher temperatures and changes that are taking place. Uh, the increase in floods and droughts have major implications for health. Every time there's a flood anywhere in the world, uh, the biggest challenge for policymakers uh, and health officials is to see that you minimize and control the outbreak of disease as a result of flooding. So there's a, a, a whole range of these benefits, health benefits that would arise if we were able to stabilize uh, the concentration of greenhouse gases and temperatures. And the converse of that is if we don't do anything, then I think the health problems all over the world will also have major economic impacts. If one looks at factories and businesses, and if we find people are going to suffer from disease to a much greater extent, this would obviously have a major harmful impact on productivity of various goods and services. Could, could you tell us what the most recent uh, developments that have been identified in global warming are of greatest concern to you that scientists never anticipated uh, three to five years ago? I think one issue that's causing a lot of concern among scientists, uh, Mr. Chairman, is uh, the possibility of collapse of the Greenland and West Antarctic ice sheets. And if that were to happen, then essentially we would be changing the geography of this planet because you would have sea level rise of several meters. Now, I'm not saying that there is any great certainty attached to that happening, but recent writings seem to raise that concern to a much greater extent than was the case, say, five years ago, because we find that there is much greater evidence of changes taking place in these large bodies of ice that are sitting on large areas of land. And if they were to collapse, then we really have a very serious crisis as far as sea level rise is concerned. Now, we just failed in the United States Congress um, by a small number of votes to put on the, um, the statutes of, uh, of the United States a requirement for uh, the production of renewable electricity as a national standard. Um, is it important for the United States to set a national standard, to set an example for the rest of the world? and? If that did happen, what would the benefits be to the planet if we uh, had a, a revolution in uh, renewable electrical generation? I could draw an analogy with the cafe standards for the automobile industry. They clearly had a major impact in terms of producing global benefits through energy security because uh, automobiles across the world improve their efficiency levels. And I would say that uh, in the case of renewable energy, uh, any such measure will spur a substantial amount of research and development, bring about reduction in costs of some of these technologies. And this would have global benefits. And this would also provide commercial opportunities to uh, American companies. I mean, if one looks at what has happened to the renewable energy industry, say, in Germany, uh, there's been a renaissance of this particular industry, 
and a number of companies that were in the conventional energy business are now thriving because they are producing renewable energy goods because there's been a very proactive policy, for instance, in that country, in Germany, which has promoted renewable energy in a big way. So I think there would be just substantial benefits and the, the, the benefits in terms of energy security worldwide and certainly for this country, which is so dependent on oil imports, uh, I would say are incalculable. incalculable. They, 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 they would be huge. So I think a measure of this nature would really make an enormous difference in, uh, in stabilizing the concentration of greenhouse gases. Okay. Thank you. The um, time of the chairman has expired. Let me recognize the gentlelady from South Dakota for a second round for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, the renewable electricity standard uh, certainly would be important, not only here but across the world in developing wind and solar uh, technologies, just as you were saying in terms of uh, uh, wasteland or other less fertile land where you could grow maybe inferior crops for food, you could grow certain crops for fuel, renewable fuels production. Uh, similarly, we have great swaths of, of land in the Great Plains with wind resources in the American Southwest, uh, and then of course the biomass in the Southeast. Uh, but And so I'm pleased that the chairman uh, probed sort of that uh, topic and the importance too of the infrastructure necessary uh, with the electricity grid because we know what we did in the energy bill helped us on the transportation fuel side and its contribution to greenhouse gases. But we also know on the electricity side that that contribution is even greater uh, and hope that those new energy sources would be deployed to developing countries or those that are beginning to match the United States in terms of energy consumption. You had mentioned previously uh, in response to Mr. Hall's questions the importance of the market signals of a price on carbon. And I know I'm sort of probing here with you some, some policy versus the, the scientific analysis that you've done. But in all of your discussions uh, with those around the world and how we uh, best send the market signal without doing damage uh, to GDP uh, in the short term or the long term, looking at, again, the opportunity uh, for economic growth uh, in light of your example of Germany and how we've lost market share here in the U.S. in renewable uh, technologies to Japan and Germany and other countries. Do you have a sense, is there a consensus that is emerging uh, as it relates to cap and trade and how you uh, allocate the allowances versus a carbon tax, uh, at least at this stage of the discussion here in the United States, uh, my um, preference would probably be cap and trade in that based on an auction of the allowances, um, you could generate a revenue stream to help soften the economic blow to lower income Americans, uh, put that money toward R&D as well and infrastructure development. Uh, and I also think that as given the complexities of the measures, whether it be in agriculture or other sectors, it seems to me you can over time perhaps more easily develop a global market and allow the market to help us versus a carbon tax that may be different in different countries and, and the political uh, challenges that we face. And, and I don't know if a carbon tax as it relates to imports, exports, and how that frustrates uh, international trade. Do you have any thoughts based on your conversations with policymakers in other parts of the world as to whether or not any consensus is emerging uh, in terms of a preferred approach? Ma'am, I think we would really need a combination of approaches. One would be essentially through cap and trade types of measures. You would also need some regulation. I mean, whether one looks at appliances or automobiles, um, <clears throat> setting certain standards and benchmarks, even in the case of buildings, would make an enormous difference because uh, in the building sector, we do consume a lot of energy and much of that can be reduced through the right kinds of technologies and know-how built into the design of buildings. And uh, may I also say that perhaps taxation me measures can make a difference. Uh, take the case of automobiles. Perhaps there ought to be a higher tax on inefficient vehicles rather than efficient vehicles. And I think there could be 
incentives being pr provided to efficient devices. So um, it seems to me one needs a combination of regulatory me measures, one needs uh, taxation and fiscal measures, and perhaps the creation of a market through maybe a cap and trade type of system. Um, and I think all of this will place a price on carbon. And once you, we, we, we see carbon being priced in the market, there would be research and development efforts being made to come up with low carbon solutions. And even the consumer would react to these signals in the market and perhaps go in for goods and services that represent much lower carbon intensity. So I think we need a package and a mix of measures and the debate should really look at uh, how the public is willing to accept a mix of these and how one might be able to bring about a transi transition without too much of hardship to any section of society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. General Lady's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thank you for uh, uh, indulging the second round of, of questions. Uh, in your, um, I was just looking at your recommendations, that the panel's recommendations for uh, mitigation. Uh, I, as I understand it, one of the problems with, with global warming is the warming of the oceans, and not just salt water, but also large freshwater bodies or rivers. Um, and I see you nodding. Uh, in your discussions or studies about nuclear power, uh, which is the one thing in your energy supply recommendations and the panel's recommendations that I uh, have a problem with, some several problems with, did you discuss the uh, millions of gallons a day that go through the reactor, for instance, in my district, taken out of the Hudson River, circulated and returned to the river in a stream of water so hot that it kills the fish in the river if they happen to be too close? Is, given that we have in this country 103 operating nuclear plants at this point and that some plans would call for that to be multiplied worldwide, is, is there a point at which the direct warming of these bodies of water by using them to, to cool a nuclear core essentially has the same effect of warming the ocean? Uh, we, we have assessed some of these uh, implications of expanded nuclear power generation. Um, but to be quite honest, we really would have to do that on a very specific uh, location basis uh, to be able to come up with uh, what the local implications of any such measure should be. I, I do recall when I was doing my doctoral work in North Carolina, there was a major plant that was being proposed in North Carolina, a nuclear power plant. And that would have raised the temperature of a body of water by something like 2 to 2.5 degrees Fahrenheit. And through the public hearings that took place, they just gave up that plant because they found that some forms of life that existed over there would have vanished with that kind of temperature increase. So I think we have to be very sensitive to some of these impacts. Right. Not to mention the fossil fuels that are burned in the mining and milling of uranium, the transportation of the uranium, the other fuel supplies that are used for enrichment, transportation to the plant of the uh, enriched fuel, the transportation if we ever find a repository for spent fuel to a high-level waste storage site, uh, the cooling water that's constantly circled uh, circulated in the cooling ponds uh, in the meanwhile while we're storing it on site. All those things use energy, so I, I just wanted to throw that out. Um, there was an article in um, a recent paper about uh, some nuclear plants in the southeast United States that had to be or were facing the possibility of being shut down because the drought in the southeast in Georgia and Florida and the Carolinas has gotten so bad that the river level had dropped to the point where they couldn't take the cooling water out and cool the plant without the danger of either uh, drawing river level down further or just because of the reduced flow in the stream uh, that the, the additional heat they're dumping into the, into the river would be too much for any of the life in the river. So that's, you don't have to answer that, that's just more uh, of the same thought. An article in the, this past Sunday's uh, New York Times, which uh, you may have seen, I'm sure you've, you're well aware of this, uh, one of the major uh, issues that some people bring up is the global demand uh, for meat and the defoliation of larger areas of rainforest uh, to grow grain to feed 
uh, uh, cattle. And in fact, uh, according to the story, uh, significant greenhouse gases are released uh, by the, uh, the growing of cattle for meat. And uh, just this past week, the President of Brazil announced emergency measures to halt the burning and cutting of the country's rainforests for crop and grazing land. In the last five months alone, the government of Brazil says 1,250 square miles were lost. Um, and then on the inside, there's a little graph that shows uh, that the average 1,100-pound beef cow can produce ma uh, manure at a clip of 14.6 tons annually, which of course means methane being released by the manure. And the, the average Iowa hog will produce 16.7 tons of manure for each of the 2,900 residents of the state. Um, that combined with the release of manure from landfilling, I'm, I'm sorry, of, of methane, there's, there's several sources of methane, uh, decomposing uh, uh, plant waste, which uh, Congresswoman Hersa Sandlin re mentioned in the forests, but also in uh, you know, any wild environment, and al also decomposing mis municipal solid waste in landfills release methane, which are vented out those upside down J-shaped vents that we drive past as we uh, as we're on the highway. And I also know from having a lot of farms in my district and talking to the farmers, be they horse or cattle farmers, that they all have a severe manure management problem. This might seem a little off the wall and, and uh, to some in this country, I think, uh, but uh, it, it strikes me that there's a possibility to, since methane is 20 times worse than carbon dioxide, if it's released and enters the upper atmosphere, uh, it's worse than carbon dioxide for global warming, that perhaps we should be examining ways of capturing the methane, be it from manure or from decomposing matter in landfills or in the forests, as was pointed out before. And if you burn the methane for power, well, at least you're reducing by a factor of, uh, of you know, 20 the, um, the impact on climate change. It, did you comment on that, or? Well, in countries like China and even in India, uh, a lot of the, the animal refuse is used for generating biogas, and that's <clears throat> burnt as a fuel. So in a sense, you're capturing uh, what would have been emitted into the atmosphere. And I think a program of that nature, I remember way back in the early 70s, Senator Gaylord Nelson introduced a bill uh, based on the work that he had seen being done in China and India on providing subsidies for biogas plants in some of the farm states. I really don't know what happened subsequently. But um, I think this is an area that requires a comprehensive national policy. Uh, but internationally, let me mention a concern that I have, sir. With the shift towards greater consumption of animal protein, we're going to find more and more food grains being provided just to produce animal protein. And this article clearly showed the equation between, let's say, X kilograms of food grains or X pounds of food grains producing one pound of meat protein. Um, I think with higher incomes, this is happening everywhere in the world. And I've been saying this, of course, with muted breath, that I think the world has to consume much less meat because this would certainly make human beings healthier and it would make this only planet that we have a bit healthier too because we are really releasing a lot of emissions of greenhouse gases through the entire cycle. I just wanted to mention that. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Great. Gentlemen's time has expired and I think we might be able to come back to each of you one more time. Um, you know, there was a lot of good news uh, generated uh, right at the end of 2007. And, uh, and here in the United States, an astounding new number. Uh, of all of the new electrical generating capacity installed in the United States in 2007, 30 percent of all of the new installed capacity was wind. 56 percent of the new installed capacity was natural gas. 10% was coal, 1% was oil, and 3% was other renewables. 
Now, that's an incredible revolution in the United States without a national renewable electricity standard. So wind is moving very, very rapidly. Uh, and globally, uh, last year, there was 16,000 new megawatts of wind installed globally and only 3,000 uh, new uh, uh, megawatts of, uh, of uh, nuclear installed globally. And in the United States, there was no new nuclear la last year. There will be no new nuclear this year or next year or the year after or the year after or the year after. In fact, there is an expectation that by the end of 2010 that we will see 80,000 new megawatts of wind installed globally just by the end of 2010. There is only 80,000 megawatts of installed capacity of nuclear in the country of France. So there is obviously something happening here uh, that uh, is working. It is working in the marketplace. Uh, and it is something that we, I think, as a nation should uh, uh, put in place as a policy uh, that uh, can give the leadership to the rest of the world. Uh, because in many, many instances in third world countries, in developing countries, uh, wind is a better option than a huge nuclear power plant, than a huge coal-fired plant in some remote village. Uh, it will bring them electricity more quickly, more efficiently, uh, and, uh, and with much fewer environmental impacts right in that lo local community as well. Can you talk a little bit about this technological revolution and how already the regulations that maybe 20 states in the United States have put in place and certain countries around the world have put in place have already generated this tremendous revolution uh, that we are beginning to identify in a significant way uh, occurring here and around the world. Thank you, sir. Yes, I would like to say, let me first refer to wind energy. I mean, this is a remarkable record of technological development that has made such a difference in the last 25 to 30 years. Wind energy technology has progressed so substantially and the costs of power generation from wind and under regimes of wind um, speeds has changed so drastically that the whole thing has become completely viable. And I expect that this will continue, the kinds of sizes of machines that are now being produced in Europe and in this country are so much bigger, so much uh, lower in terms of cost per unit that it would make a sea change to the economics of this particular option. But there are several other areas and one area that I'd like to mention for the reference of the honorable members uh, is the fact that there are 1.6 billion people in this world who have no access to modern forms of energy and certainly no electricity. And essentially, these are people who really don't have any means for lighting their homes. They live in small homes. They are poor people, large numbers of people crowded together in a small one-room dwelling and no form of lighting. Now, I have decided as a mission personally and through my institute to launch something that I call Lighting a Billion Lives. We have developed a set of solar lanterns that cost the equivalent of about $70, and a set of solar flashlights or torches. These cost the equivalent of about $8. And I think if one can get these financed, either through corporate philanthropy, to development assistance, not free of cost, but we price them in a manner that's affordable for the poor people of the world, it can make such a difference. And more than anything else, this obviates the possibility of setting up large centralized coal-based power stations just to supply electricity to rural areas through transmission and distribution systems that are often terribly wasteful. So I, I think one has to jumpstart the, these, this kind of process. And I think biomass gasification has enormous potential. There's a lot of agricultural residue, as I mentioned, in several parts of the world which can be gasified for power generation, for local and decentralized distribution. So I think we're on the verge of a revolution of this nature. And it would help enormously if the US 
could get into some partnership activities with the developing countries because you can then develop technological solutions that would have relevance certainly to this country but to several other parts of the world and you're then therefore forestalling the possibility of conventional energy development which obviously would have greenhouse gas emissions over a period of time. So I think, as you said, Mr. Chairman, I think we're on the verge of a revolution. But if we could assist this through policy measures, through legislation, we'd be able to achieve results that much faster. Well, uh, Dr. Bachuri, that is the goal of the Select Committee this year. Um, we are going to be visiting uh, Brazil in uh, February. Uh, and it will give us an opportunity to begin to think through what we should do uh, to find ways to, to partner uh, with, uh, with countries that are emerging economically, uh, but with sometimes uh, too high of a price paid in terms of the environmental impact inside of that uh, country, which we now realize has uh, an effect upon the rest of the world because there is only one sky and, uh, and we're all going to be affected by it. So it's in our interest in the United States uh, in Europe to find ways of partnering with these countries, with new technologies, uh, with ways of compensating uh, these countries not to engage in the same kind of destructive behavior that we did in our first generation of industrialization. So we're going to explore that in a very, very aggressive way uh, this year to try to develop policy recommendations to uh, achieve that goal. Uh, the uh, time of the chair has expired. Let me turn once again and recognize the gentlelady from South Dakota if she has any other questions. Uh, the gentleman from uh, New York, Mr. Hall. Uh, I have one question. Oh, there, I'll turn my mic on. Uh, I'm glad to see that one of the key topics in discussion in Bali was the technology transfer to help developing countries leapfrog over fossil fuel development. Uh, and I thought that the President, our President's call for an international clean energy fund to meet this goal was one of the few bright spots of the State of the Union address this week. America has the technological know-how and the resources to develop many of the technolo technologies that could be used to help bring developing countries into a clean energy future without having to go through the fossil dependent uh, phase that we have spent so much time in. What steps should our government be taking to aid this process, which would also make America an energy exporter and not just a fuel importer? Um, so I personally think that uh, there are several areas in which there could be cooperative activity between the U.S. and some of these countries. One would be in terms of technology development. I do realize scientific and technical know-how is at a very high level in this country. But often to ensure that these technologies would be directly useful in the developing countries, you need to customize some of these technologies for application in the developing countries. And that would involve partnerships. It would involve working with local organizations and local institutions to come up with the right mix of technological solutions. I think there's a lot that could be done in the policy arena. I mean, in this country, there's been uh, a major achievement in terms of improvement of appliance efficiency for household appliances. And this took place about 10 to 15 years ago. And the measures by which this was brought about would be of great relevance to a number of countries in the world. Um, if one looks at what has happened in the state of California in bringing about energy efficiency improvements, I think that's very, very heartening. And I think this required a lot of policy and regulatory measure, measures, all of which would be of great relevance to developing countries. So what I would submit is that quite apart from scientific and technical cooperation which would help flow of technology on a commercial or let's say facilitated basis through facilitation by, by the government, uh, I think there's a lot of benefit in transferring some of the uh, good practices, uh, the policy experiences in this country that have created say a market for uh, improved uh, appliance efficiency and so on. Uh, because that's where I find in a number of developing countries there is a weakness. Uh, and and if, if we don't address that weakness, 
then the transfer of technology will not take place to the extent that would be optimal. So I think that there, there, there's need to define some of these comprehensive areas where one could ensure cooperation. Thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, I, I thank you. And, and let me just uh, conclude with a, with a couple of uh, questions. Um, in your opinion, what, what constitutes dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system, and how close are we uh, to reaching dangerous interference with the climate system as a result of human activities? And are we there already? Um, <clears throat> I think this is really the central objective of the Framework Convention on Climate Change, as is clearly stated in Article 2 of the, the Convention. But may I submit, sir, that um, the definition of what's dangerous is really something that involves value judgments. And when you get into the issue of value judgments, then you necessarily have to take into account some of the equity dimensions of the problem. Now, I've been talking to a lot of leaders around the world. If you talk to some of them, they'll tell you that we've already crossed that threshold of dangerous, because these are some of the most vulnerable regions in the world, where the impacts of climate change are already causing hardship, if not a very tangible threat to life and property. So I really think to come up with a global definition of uh, what's dangerous in my view, requires a Gandhian approach. Gandhi, in his exhortations to society, said that anything you do, you must look at what the implications will be for the least privileged. And I think if we are going to add even a single unit of greenhouse gases to the, ads, to the Earth's atmosphere, we need to understand what it's going to do to the least privileged. And I think when, particularly in a society that's so focused on human rights and civil liberties and the right to live and the right to exist, I think we have to treat that as the touchstone of whatever policies we are evaluating. And if one was to, one was to use that yardstick, and based on my own conversations with people in these countries, I would say that we have probably cross that threshold in their perspective. But it's for the global community to decide what it regards as acceptable in terms of dangerous. Thank you, Doctor. Um, that was uh, very eloquent. Um, I want to uh, conclude just by uh, thanking you and um, telling you that a year ago, when Speaker Pelosi uh, created this Select Committee on Global uh, Warming and Energy Independence, that there was still a debate going on as to whether or not uh, human beings were having an effect upon the climate and whether or not that uh, change in climate was dangerous for the planet and for uh, human beings and other living things. Um, because of your work, because of your panel's work, um, that debate is now over. And one by one, as each one of your four reports were uh, issued in 2007, uh, it ended the debate over that issue. And now we are moving on to the question of what should we do about it. But your constant warnings about what the impacts are, your, uh, your international leadership is something that was justifiably recognized with the Nobel Peace Prize. Because from Darfur to Somalia, and increasingly other countries all across the planet, the impacts of climate change have profound effects upon the stability of nations. And uh, you uh, have now made it uh, no longer a debatable issue. And uh, like Gandhi, um, you have now made an incredible change in the way in which the world views these issues. And we thank you uh, for that. Um, what I would ask, if you could, is to give us your final summary. Give us your final warning uh, to us in terms of what the world's expectations uh, are of the United States in 2008, because you do believe that we are so close to that tipping point. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. First, I must thank you for 
giving me this opportunity and the honorable members of this select committee. It's indeed a great privilege for me to appear before you. And as a final summary of what I feel on the subject, may I submit, as you rightly emphasize, Mr. Chairman, that the science is very clear. The impacts of climate change are serious, they are measurable, and we know that they are going to get worse over time and over space. So therefore, if we want to be responsible in terms of saving all forms of life and humanity across the globe, both in this generation and the coming generations, we need to act. We need to act by ensuring that we adapt to climate change, and there are some societies which just don't have the ability or the capacity to be able to adapt. I think uh, as a humanitarian measure, we must help those societies to adapt to climate change. But also looking at how we might be able to prevent or uh, delay impacts that would cause serious problems in the future, mitigation is absolutely essential. And I'd like to say that based on our reports, we find that the cost of mitigation, if anything, is going to be minimal. And in some cases, it might lead to so many benefits that the minor cost that we incur would be largely offset with the benefits that we reap from mitigation measures. And I think we also have to ensure that the US is in step with the rest of the world. And the rest of the world, if I may say, from all that I've been able to understand of what's happening, is moving in a direction where we will have a low carbon economy. The US has to be in a leader posi leadership position to bring about this transition to a low carbon economy. It's not going to be costly. It's going to be of enormous importance and benefit to business to take early action in this area. And I think more than anything else, the rest of the world looks at the US for leadership. It has been a leader in so many respects. After the Second World War, what the US brought about is really uh, what we see as the benefits across the world of thriving democracies, of economies that are doing so well. We are at a similar juncture today. And I think if we can take leadership in this country to move in the right direction, there would be huge benefits and certainly an avoidance of huge costs that otherwise would accrue. So I, I would like to salute this uh, select committee, sir, for the initiatives that you've taken. And I think if we move along rapidly along the lines that you were outlined, Mr. Chairman, uh, I think the whole world will look up to you, will salute you. And I'm sure this society overall would be benefit enormously along with the rest of the world. Thank you, Dr. Petrari. And uh, as we close um, this hearing, um, I think you as well deserve um, the recognition uh, for the work which you did um, and the difference that it's made in the way in which the world and the United States uh, views these issues. Uh, and I think that you deserve the warm recognition as we conclude this committee uh, uh, hearing, uh, in addition to the um, Nobel Peace Prize, which you received. I think that we should give you uh, our own warm response as well. Thank you so much for your work. Thank you. Thank you. This hearing is adjourned.